Anyway, we are thrilled to have Siobhan Reardon, who is a legend in Philadelphia, a legend in her own time, uh, which is unusual for most people. Um, I know you've got the bio, Siobhan's bio, but she runs the largest library system in the state, one of the largest 15 in the country. <clears throat> Fascinating um, private sector career first, which we'll talk about, and then public sector, and I know a lot of you are interested in that kind of combination, so we will definitely talk about that. But um, Siobhan is really a trailblazer nationally, not just in the city, um, and kind of sets the cutting edge tone for libraries going forward. Uh, it's not just bricks and mortar, which I was raised with. I'm old, cart catalog, which you don't even know what they are. But we didn't have the internet, we didn't have you know. Well, the cart catalogs now serve as jewelry boxes. You know, these people you, oh, are they trendy? You, you can actually literally buy. Are uh, they trendy? Yes. Okay, well, I used to use them. Yes. Anyway, <clears throat> but um, a huge operating budget, $50 million. 800 people report to you, which is exhausting for me to think about. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, and you were named Librarian of the Year. So um, very, very exciting background. And you've done some very cool things we'll talk about. Um, really to connect the libraries in the neighborhoods. We'll talk about some community organizers, some other really cool stuff that, yep. uh, that you've done. Um, and I mentioned the private sector career. Um, Siobhan worked for the Borden Dairy Company. That's Elsie the Cow, isn't it? It is Elsie the Cow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have you all ever heard of Elsie the Cow? Oh, yeah, yeah she exists oh now. OK, cool. <laughs> Elsie the Cow and Pinkertons. And Pinkerton Security Guard. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Not, you were not a security guard. You no. Were, yeah. no. <laughs> you were the budget manager, I see. Yeah, okay. Anyway, and a great a bunch of degrees, which I won't, won't go over. But anyway, welcome, Siobhan. Thank you. You're Pleasure. very dear to come, and we are thrilled to have you, and you are inspiring. Um, so you have to be inspiring. I'll try. Yeah, we'll give, give, give it a go, someone. Okay, so we, used to, we, we like to talk about your background, your original background. Yep. What in your youth or childhood uh, inspired you? Why, why did you... Did you ever think you'd be where you are now? No, not at all. So I uh, grew up in Yonkers, New York, and I'm uh, the sixth of nine children to Bill and Babs O'Loughlin. <laughs> and, um, and so I will tell you that being uh, the sixth of nine children sitting at a dining room table, you fought for literally every piece of bread on the table because I had five older brothers. So, you know, and it built, yeah. and it built a lot of character, a lot of spine, so you knew how to fight, you knew what to, you know, just sort of all, all that, you know, the, the, the piece about my life that, that transitioned over time was, you know, learning to, you know, learn to win, to pick a fight versus constantly always be battling. <laughs> that, um, so that, that sort of, um, I knew then that I was going to be a little bit different than the rest of my family because I was the only one that ever went to a public library. Though I have to tell you, I never, ever, ever, ever thought I would be where I am today, I have to say. Um, I, um, through um, high school and college, actually, when I have a grad, um, an undergraduate degree from um, the State University of New York College of Purchase in Political Science. And, um, and prior to that, I went to Westchester Community College. I thought I wanted to be a social worker. And, um, and through my first semester of college, they, they had you do, um, in the field. And the, my first field work was at the um, county nursing home in Westchester County, New York. And it was the most devastating experience I had ever witnessed. It was mm -hmm. public nursing uh, for people who basically took their parents and deposited them in these homes. And that's when I realized I can't do this. And it takes a different type of person. It mm -hmm. takes a different type of um, deeply rooted um, sort of um, humanity that I, I didn't have at the time. So then I moved on to politics and I have been a, polit a, a political junkie ever since then. And so when I finished my degree um, at, at, at SUNY Purchase, wanted, thought I wanted to uh, go into the CIA. I had dreams of becoming a spy like, <laughs> nobody, like nobody's business. And, <laughs> or going into the State Department because I wanted to travel around the world, right? So those were, those were my benchmarks. So I, take, I start taking the exams to go into the CIA and I pass the first round and then, you know, you go to a second and then there's a whole language thing. And my, and my father kind of stopped me in my tracks and said, you cannot do this. Uh, why? I'm passing the test, I'm making it. No, <laughs> your face is all you're talking for you. You can never be. My face is all talking for me. I, you know, so I then, you know, when he said that, I spent the rest of my life like, I'm going to meet and cover so 
nobody really know what I'm thinking. And you could play poker. I couldn't. I was terrible, terrible, terrible. And then I started thinking about the State Department. That's so funny. And, um, and then the State Department didn't work out so well. And then so that's when I moved into, finished up, and then went into corporate America and began my career as a, literally a staff accountant with no accounting experience and started taking all of those night classes around the business, the business management work. And so spent, uh, what was fascinating, and this is sort of where I became more analytical over time, because you have to, if you're gonna be in a management career, you have to learn to be highly analytical and understand either the words or the numbers or the, or the thing in front of you and sort of break it down um, to a way that makes it, you understand it, but you also understand the circumstances around it. So I did become involved in strategic planning for the, I was in the international division of Borden and did get to take a trip to Chicago. So, um, <laughs> and, um, and so, and with that, built my career around that I knew I wanted to, so then I started really forming where it is I wanted to go and I went to Fordham University to be, and got a, we got a degree in international economics and, um, and then on from there, um, um, went into, um, so, so I stayed in corporate America for almost 12, 14 years of my, of my career. Um, and, it, and so what happened is that, you know, in the early 70s to mid 70s, there was a lot of change in corporate America, a lot of corporations taking over other corporations, taking over other corporations. And so um, was laid off uh, um, in, uh, the board from the Borden Company because uh, KKR, you know, Kravitz, mm -hmm. you know, a, a private equity firm scooped up the Borden Company. And then I went over to the Pinkerton Security Card Company and I was in budgets and became the budget director there after a while. So numbers became, a, a, what was so fascinating about that, is numbers became my business. And I hated math all growing up, right? So <laughs> always failed math. Uh, but this became because what, what was that? It was all understanding what a number was and how, where a number is placed. And you know, how you use numbers. So it became um, a, a big strong point in my life. And so, <clears throat> so a couple of years into the board, uh, into Pinkerton, um, got laid off again. Another company came in, scooped it up, and. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really interesting lesson. So, what was interesting then, but, you know, at that time, what was so, so what happens to Siobhan O'Loughlin Reardon now? Uh, because I, I did get married when I was at the board and company, and, you know, I'm now child and went on the way at, at when I'm leaving, as, as I'm leaving um, Pinkerton, went to New York Public Library <coughs> yeah, and said I, yeah, I they had a job. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so shifting, it's like, so where do I go? But I saw there was a position for a budget analyst at New York Public Library and I said, oh, that's interesting. I could go, I could try that, you know, for a couple of years and then go back into corporate America. 32 years later, I, you know, I went into libraries and have never left. But it was inter it was interesting, and this is where you really saw it. You, you begin to see where women in the workplace, the so thinking around women in the workplace, and, and because I was offered the job, I turned the job down because I realized I was pregnant with my second child. The head of the budget department called me back and said, I'd still like to offer you the job, and I said, I'm not turning you down twice. <coughs> and so with that, you know, they worked through and gave me all of the, you know, um, what it took for me to have a baby and have a family and you know really sort of beginning to think and and that was monumental when you think about uh, those you know I'm 62 years old so I'm kind of early in the stage about women and, and women with families in the workplace and how important it was to have um, progressive men actually really at the time thinking about because they were they were men with families as well and understood it so that was pretty important um, to be able to do to continue mm -hmm. to work and right. continue with my career during right, that period right, right. of time. So, so, so that's fascinating. So we'll get to at sort of the end your life lessons for all of us, um, and you have that wonderful presentation we just looked at. But one I'll just mention right here or ask you about is um, so you had to be tremendously flexible mm -hmm. because you were like and you know, be married to a man with that was tremendously flexible. To be married to a man that that does take flexibility. <laughs> I do that too. <laughs> that was that was flexible. <laughs> You know, I was like, I could have sworn in a stack of Bible that marry, never marry an Irish guy. What did I do? I married an Irish guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is so strange. But I, I also, I also knew I couldn't marry somebody who had just come from his mother, mm -hmm. and so Jim had been on his own for ten years, and and that made him, you know, he. It wasn't like I had to iron his shirts or cook meals for him. He could do all of that, and so, mm -hmm. and then when we had children, he was as much of he was. He's been my partner in all of that. Mm -hmm. All no, along. Yeah. Well, no, so, I did, I did but that was important to the career, right? Right. You know, so a different situation.
situation, yeah. I would not I would not be here. I, I can pretty much tell you that. Yeah, no, I can say that too. I can say that. And sometimes we do get into work life balance and, mm -hmm. and the importance of luck, frankly. Yes. Uh, but no, what, what I meant there was your flexibility. <coughs> and I love that, you know, because oftentimes when I talk to all of you, you say, oh my God, you know, I don't have a passion, a mission, like I had, don't have to be this thing. And for you, and actually for me, um, you've just made it work. I mean, yeah. frankly, if you hadn't been laid off by Pinkerton or Elsie, you, know, you might have stayed, right? Well, sure. I mean, I thought I saw myself growing in that corporation because I, I will say that the then president of the of the of the Borden Company was a gentleman by the name of Gene um, Sullivan. He probably was so light years ahead uh, of most corporate presidents who saw that the value because Borden products. I mean, remember it was all if you didn't have the white the woman in the family, you know, buying Borden products, you, the company was out of business really. So he saw he he found women to be an essential component of the success of the corporation, and so he's the one that first started this um, bringing um, women emerging in the organization together on a fairly regular basis. And so that was 1978. That's a long time ago. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I'm older than you, but it's well, not much. close. <laughs> anyway, so okay, so we're going to fast forward to the library, mm -hmm. where you've been since 08. Yes, so over 10 years. And you came, I, admit, I skipped this part, but you came via the New York Public Library, the Brooklyn Public Library, the Westchester uh, Library System, Westchester, New York. So what's it like? You get to the library, is it still bricks, uh, bricks and mortar? Is it still stodgy? Uh, what, what did you, how did you know, okay, I've got to do these things? So let me tell you why Brooklyn Public, uh, the, uh, the uh, Free Library of Philadelphia interested me. So I had, um, I don't know if any of you have read the book, uh, Prayer for the City by Buzz Bissinger. Mm -hmm. Really important. Fabulous book. And when I was required at Bit reading. <laughs> yeah, it is required reading. Um, and then prior to that, when I was at New York Public Library, I was the budget officer for the branch library system. So New York Public Library, is a, there are three library systems in New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, and um, the New York Public Library. And, um, and so I, I was then in the branch system. And we were watching, it, and it was, I'm trying to remember, so this was early, early, early 80s, I want to say, and the budget, you know, the budget tanks in New York, Philadelphia, and all this sort of thing. And what had been happening is we were watching Ed Rendell at the time beginning to talk about, you know, because they were going through the budget crisis here, talking about um, having libraries run by volunteers. And we're watching this in New York, and I think Giuliani was the pres was the mayor then, and we're saying to ourselves, holy moly, if that happens in Philadelphia, it's absolutely going to happen in New York because Philadelphia is a much more significant union town than, and, and New York is a union town, but not to the degree Philadelphia still is. And so watching that, and so when this position came up, and I was at Westchester Library System at the time, I said, I have to go for this, wow. for this job. Oh, cool. um, because it was... Um, it, it really was this interesting, uh, the hue and cry around the public library system, well-funded or not, was significant in the city. And so my predecessor, Elliot Chilcron, had been constantly sort of um, battling the mayor and, and, uh, and so forth. And then when I read um, Buzz Bissinger's um, whole, whole chapter on the relationship between the mayor and the library, and it's like, I don't know of a city where the library plays such an important role in, in the lifeblood of the city mm -hmm. than, than here. And so yeah. uh, that's why I applied and fortunately I got the job. <coughs> but, well, we're lucky. So how many libraries are there and how did you, so how did you figure out what your missions were? Right. So um, so it's a big system. It's it's uh, 55 facilities uh, now um, in, in, this, in, the, in the library system. It's one of, it's, as I said, it's one of the uh, larger library systems in the country. <coughs> I don't know, you, know, you probably don't know this, but literally two weeks after I arrived here, the, con the economy tanks and, um, <laughs> and the, the budget for the city budget is cut by 20% and the state budget is cut by 32%. And I'm like, well, how do I do this? And so the first, the first folly was 10%. I said, oh, I can do a 10% cut. I'll take a little bit out of library materials. I'll take out the vacant position, done. Um, well, that didn't work. And so, you know, two weeks later was a 20% cut. And now I'm like, wow, this is $8 million out of a $42 million budget. This is a giant, and plus the, all the money out of the state. So that was when I recommended closing 11 libraries to my board to say, I can run a really viable system with 40 libraries. It's still an enormous system. So those 40 libraries remain healthy. 
would those 11 libraries have to go? For two libraries, and those 11 libraries, would, we would have to shutter those 11 libraries. So everybody, oh, great business decision, mayor says great business decision, budget director's great business decision, put it out to the public, and oh, right? So I don't, how, were you, any of you here, remember any of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I still, to this day, having been now 11 years here, say that was still the right decision, but it needed to be handled, you know, people grabbed the narrative and I wasn't, you know, I couldn't get ahead of it because you were literally shuttering libraries and neighborhoods and for the community. And again, I was two weeks here, didn't, didn't understand, or, or a month here, didn't know the communities because this is a city of communities mm -hmm. and these community people really own every asset there is in every single community. So lesson learned. Um, but the city, I have to say, doesn't have the, asset, doesn't have the funding to sustain the multitude of assets that it has. And so there, at some point in time, the city will have to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna come under my terms, so, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, so, there, so those were all the great, so those were the decision points. Okay, so we were told we had to keep, you know, the, we, we, we were sued, we lost the suit, so we had to keep all the facilities open. <clears throat> but I was running those facilities on three and four days a week and literally sort of bouncing back between three and four days and three and four days. So, and it hurts to watch that because, you know, the, the better part of the system is, you know, half of the time it's closed and, it's, you know, it's, it's but it, it was what it was and that's what the city wanted. Um, but, and so you really began to understand as we, as, you know, at a time that I, and I went to back to the board and I said, look, we have, cha have to change the way we operate this system. We can't continue to operate exactly as we were, as if we had, you know, 12 more million dollars back in the budget. So we have to figure this out. And so we spent the next three years in a massive strategic planning process, starting with scenario planning. So scenario planning um, is, you know, it was the government's gonna take over everything and run everything, you know, two, you have more money than God you could possibly imagine and what would it look like and then two in between. And then we built the strategic plan from that point. And we have lived in, so that plan just expired last year and we probably came about 70% of the way through success in most of that, um, and, more, and had everything to do with engaging the staff, because we had more than 80 staff members participating in what was written and how it was gonna be implemented. And I highly encourage all of you, as you move through your life, you make sure that a body of people around you is helping guide you, um, and that you're in a more position, you're in a better position to listen than act um, constantly, mm -hmm. so. Interesting. <clears throat> so you're talking about communities and how we're sitting mm -hmm. in communities. Um, and you're very much involved in the community. So what was that whole initiative? And tell us a little bit about the community organizers and sure. how you figured out you needed them. Um, so yeah. so the, one of the best things um, I have to say about this, about this specific position is unique to other libraries uh, around the country is that I'm responsible for not only the public operation, so that's the city and the state funding coming through, is the, but I'm also responsible for the foundation, so that's why I have these two titles, president, president of the foundation and director of the public library system. And um, when um, our budgets were depleted, what happened, and it was unusual for other nonprofits, was that we, our, our foundation giving went through the roof. And so we were able to keep a lot, like our after school program, our summer reading program, all of these things that you know um, really support the children uh, during the school year and then during the summer. Or if we were able to sustain that, but we lost a huge amount of money, um, funding in the, in the library materials budget. But the reason I say this is because through this process we received some very interesting grant work, uh, grants from like the Knight Foundation and other foundations um, at, related to technology. So one of the grants, um, we received was a very significant grant from the Knight Foundation to put um, to, to put technology in community and community or, uh, in community organizations. And so, what we, so with that grant, so we at the start of it was six what we call them hotspots around the city, and, and we brought the technology and the training into these community operations. And the and the community the deal was we want access to your constituents, but you and you have to take care of the, the what we bring here. And what was absolutely interesting about, and what it was also personed by people that, um, a kind of new brand of staff, of young, geeky, you know, totally community-oriented staff. And so this was a project that probably has driven every single decision that I've been pushing forward since then. So number one, um, we learned from these wonderful, geeky young people that 
to a constituent coming in to get advantage of these services had never crossed the transom of a public library. Why? They felt that they had to be literate in order to use a public library. So that spoke absolute volumes about who we were, how we presented ourselves, what the librarians were doing or not doing, the physical access to the building was wrong. And so that, um, and then those geeky young wonderful people actually set the precedent around the, the how it is we hired and the positions that we were hiring. So with that, we hired what are called digital resource specialists, and so every single library has one of them. And they are the ones that train the people on the, the PCs, which is the heaviest use of our, of our libraries to date right now. But it was how it is we had to change the physical facility to be a much more accessible, um, accepting place for anybody who came in, irrespective of your literacy skills and irrespective of your capacity, but really understood that our job here now is to make that person fulfill whatever it is they came to, to be and want to be going forward. Mm -hmm. So that really set the stage for mm -hmm. this next stage right now. Fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about management in this school. Um, you have 800 people reporting to you. That's a lot of management. Tell me, give me a couple of tips about that and give me a get in that position, God forbid, I don't like people reporting to me at all, but I'm impressed. Uh, and then how does that fit in your pie, the pie of your day or your year, okay. the management slice? What else do you do? So I have 17 reporting to me, which is which oh, is, which is 10 too many. Okay. Um, 10 too many. <laughs> oh, yeah. you, I think the rule of thumb in good management is you have like three or four or five, something like that, but I have 17 reporting to me right now. And, um, and that's exhausting, um, but it's a way I keep my, um, and some of it is, 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 is any of it micromanagement, mm. potentially, but then some of it is I really want to know, because we're, we're such a diverse organization with, with such diverse services, so what happens in the Read by Fourth campaign is extraordinarily different from what happens even in our youth services program, it's very different from what's happening in civic engagement, it's very different mm. from what's happening in IT and accounting, all that. So, um, and so that, so that world, um, and that's, this is one of the things I absolutely love about this position, is its diversity. I come into work, as I said, tell Colleen, I don't know what's gonna happen. I think I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but within, you know, an hour, something else is coming through, a phone call's coming through, you know, a piece of work is coming through, then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I'm not getting that bit of work I thought I was gonna get done today. And you have to be ready, you have to be absolutely ready for that. Um, but. So, as, so, so what the really big complication here is that, and I had never experienced before a civil service operation. I had experienced a union operation, but I had never <coughs> lived with civil service. Now, anybody live with civil service? You're, you have not lived until you run a civil service organization. <laughs> so uh, the rules are not yours. And you, you know, remember, I see wonderful people and I want to give them a bonus and I want to promote them, and oh. You know, this is this is work that, that everybody has to be tested, and you pick the first two off the test, and you have those two. It, it's a complicated one. So there's civil service, and then there's a very active union on top of this. So, yeah. <laughs> and then I have my you know my staff that are not represented, where you can do a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more flexibility there, and the foundation is completely um, 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 what, do we, what do we call it? Exempt. It's not that. Uh, what do you call it when when people are aren't represented. I'm sorry. I'll think about. I'll think the right word. You mean tax exempt? You mean no, no. I mean that they're not. There's not union here uh, at will. They're at will employees. Okay. So, uh, which is a whole different world altogether, and one I prefer. So, um, but, but with that, so all of the management challenges around that. So, it, you know, if you want to change a schedule, we're going to go from summer hours to winter hours. You have to present it to the union, and the union has to accept your, your change in hours. So, you know, it's interesting working through what's management prerogatives and what's, what's bargainable. And so and you can spend days, weeks, and, and years um, sort of trying to get a piece of work that you want to move through the organization done. So just be ready for patience and just be ready for the strategies behind it because the people will, it'll, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. Um, but, it again, but again, if it's worth it to you and you build the strategy and you understand the capacity or, of the organization to do it, then you, you just, you're dogged yeah, about yeah. Um, getting to that, yeah. getting to the end. So, so the pie, is there a pie that you can identify? I mean, management, it sounds like this, these 17 people, what, what they bring to you is definitely strategy and policy. And right, so if you're gonna think about what the priorities of the organization are, uh, so the ultimate priority is get those libraries open every day. So that is the promise we make to the community and that's what we do. We've been failing at that because of um, some of the issues, you may have heard in the paper and 
um, that we've only been able to get, given the budget we had, we were only getting 23 libraries open on Saturdays, and it's, it's those are six-day libraries, we now have 40. We've, we've rated other parts of our budget to make that happen. But that's a priority of the administration, and so, but I don't, I can't argue with it. It's the right thing to do, is get our, make sure our library's open, and that's the ultimate promise. And so, the mission is advanced literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity. Basically, that happens in your interactions. And the other part of it is to ensure that we are a safe place for civic engagement and enrichment, um, that people know that this is a place that you are, we, we do not pass judgment on you as you come through and your questions and, and are we satis satisfying your need to, uh, your information um, curiosity. And the third part is about serendipity and we you know, make sure that the programming we're doing and the, and the and the material we're putting on the shelves and the and the people in front of you are are driving your your curiosity to learn more mm -hmm. and be more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so, uh, so that that from a management piece of it, so where where does where do these 17 people fall in those priorities for the organization? I think that you know everybody plays their part. Um, everybody knows sort of nobody's going to do the technology work because you rely on the technology guys to do that. Nobody's going to do the finance work because you're relying but everybody has to understand what they do and why they do it. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our team meetings are fairly regular. How about fundraising, how much of that do you have? So that's probably about 45% of my job. Yeah. Um, so the 65% of it is the public service operation and managing the, so the bulk of the 800 or 700 something staff are um, city funded staff members, you know, from the, from, you know, part-time people who come in working in the after school program mm -hmm. through through um, my deputy directors, and then and then there's about 50 people on the foundation side. That's my fundraising or communication staff and a number of other mm -hmm. folks like that. So, mm -hmm. so if I don't, if we're not raising the private money, we're in, we're you know a lot of our programming are mostly around children's initiatives, youth-based initiatives, are not are not are not going to be funded. So of your 49 million. So the 49 is city and state together, and then the foundation's on top of that. So it's roughly around um, 60, probably another 14 million on top of that. Of, um, on top of that, 49 is the foundation as well. Yeah. And, and how much would you raise in a year? Do you, do you have 14 is a year. Oh you know. So, so the other piece of this, which has been important, is that in in order for us to renovate the buildings and the full tilt renovations that we've had, we've raised over 80 million dollars over the course of 10 years to do the renovations that we've had. City, again, getting back to the city, just doesn't have the funding to take care of to do what we wanted to do with our facilities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, their budget for us is roughly around a million, million and a half, and so we could do can do a couple of roofs, a couple of boilers, that that kind of thing. Which is why, when the mayor talks about the rebuilt initiative, irrespective of your position on the soda tax, it is deadly important to us and administration because it's mm. upwards of nearly $80 million, and we could never raise that kind of money for the neighborhood libraries ever. Wow. So that bit of money to you know restore 13 of our facilities <coughs> is a very big deal to us. That's a so, soda tax. Yeah. What is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more questions from me and then we get your questions. So you had some really cool life lessons we were talking about and actually Siobhan has a really neat presentation she made and I will email to all of you. Yeah. But meantime, do you have a couple of pearls yeah. that you want to give us? I do. Over um, incredible once upon a time, <laughs> I was, you know, I am a pretty stubborn person, I, I readily admit it, and some of it has served me well and some of it has gotten my way. Um, so I was in a conference at one point and I, and I was trying to make a point and there were people who were disagreeing with me here, and people who, and I just held on to my position. And so finally the, the, the woman who was the sort of facilitator looked at me and she said, Siobhan, you really do need to learn to let go of your favorite idea. And so, and I'm like, what? and she's no, 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 because you, you're not listening. It stopped me from listening, right? So because I didn't care what anybody else, I had my idea, and I wanted to push my idea, and and, and that was, boy, I bought that, and then I have, and I have lived that for a very long time. And I now st say this to my staff, you know, who are dogged in their opinion. I say, get it, I respect it, but are, what else are you listening to? Because sometimes you just have to let go because you've stopped listening. So mm -hmm. that was one. Wow. Um, That's hard. That's yeah. hard to do. Yeah, it's really, really, really yeah. hard to do. 
And Elizabeth and I have started talking about the significance of music in your life because music, whether you listen to it or play an instrument, opens up elements of your brain to allow more, whether it's um, patience or peace. Um, so I highly recommend if you don't listen to music Isn't that or cool? play music, yeah. it is really important to bring that into your life. Um, I'd like to say um, uh, one of the, um, in this whole thing of learning how to listen, and listening is really, really, really an art form. I'm still not good at it, but I really love when I see somebody who's a really good listener, um, that we have two ears and one mouth. And so that's why it's really important to think about that because it is better that you listen and then reflect and take time for self-reflection before you start sort of just talking. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important too. Yeah. And then for your for everybody here, um, as you work in community, be super aware of who's around you, how they're there, why they're there, because your cultural awareness is only going to make you a far more effective leader um, and administrator. It is a it is the thing that I think has been the biggest growth area. And so go, going back to uh, how it is we got to community organizing was, um, so this lesson around how it is we learned um, about uh, people um, understanding who's in front of you and understanding that people um, who thought that they couldn't enter a library because they were not literate. It really didn't spoke to our awareness of that, that our cultural awareness and our just sort of awareness of who's in that neighborhood because you know, our librarians like to come in and they like to sit behind the desk and wait for you to come through the door and ask a reference question. Well, that <laughs> reference died about 20 years ago. So what else are we going to do now? And so, um, so the first reflection was and when we reopened the five buildings that we completely got renovated, we put community organizers into these spaces. Um, and it was made all the difference in um, our ability to reach community that we had never reached before. Understanding, mm. you know, wh what are the associations out there? Who's there? What are the church? Where are the churches? Where are the businesses? And how does the library become that anchor? And we've seen people now driving to the library, you know, just coming in droves to the library in a place that they never saw us there before. And it's really, it's made a big difference um, in, um, in, in, our, in the work that That's we're doing. Fabulous. Yeah. And the other, you've all heard this thing about fail forward, do it, you know, because unless you sort of... What would you mean by that? So fail forward meaning that, you know, you, you, your life isn't perfect and you shouldn't be afraid to make a mistake, because I actually encourage you to make a lot of mistakes along the way, because you don't know how to self-correct, right? And so, so if you've made a mistake, if you've stumbled, to understand why you stumbled, but don't look to blame. And blaming is a terrible, terrible thing. Just understand, so what was your role in that, and how is it you can make it better, but you also what were the corrective actions you, needed to, you need to make and take in order to sort of mm -hmm. become more successful at wherever you want to, whatever the final, that <coughs> final space mm -hmm. is. So, so I'm going to email that to you yeah. and absorb it. So, okay, I think I'll save my last question for my last question. Okay. So you get questions now. Okay. Who has a question? Okay, yes. How about over here? Yes. Um, I'm just going to follow up on what you said with the fail forward thing. I know yep. you gave the example of when you first got to the free library yep. and you were new in your role yep. and kind of what you learned from right. um, turning down the road. So do you... Kind of as you've grown in the role and gotten to know it more, um, what's been kind of the most like eye-opening kind of like fail moment for you that you think made you a lot better in your role? I, I think it was that experience of really sort of making a mistake in that I thought I knew the place, and and that's when you really had to step back and say I don't know this city at all. And so within a three-month period of time, went and visited every single library, you know, the 55, and met with the staff, um, tried to meet with members, because uh, most of our libraries have a, what's called a friends group, um, and made sure that I met with the friends during that period of time, because those were the most powerful people on the anti-closure um, aspect as well. The other piece of it is that um, um, is, is the, I really then be began to understand so the library is a very different organism here in the city of Philadelphia in that it is by charter, the actual department is called the um, Board of Trustees of the Free Library of Philadelphia, and I technically report <coughs> to that board. And so what the conflict and that sort of issue was, the mayor saying, you report to me, and my board saying, no, you report to me. And I'm like, okay, you guys figure this out. Who, who am I gonna work with on this one? Because there were, there were two different, um, pieces and it still works that way today you know just sort of the mayor wanting a different having one pressure and then the board having though well, the board supports me where I want to go 
but you know, there's this, there is a tension around the quote, independence of this of the library when you're predominantly city funded. And so that was the, so that piece of it that's still, you know, how do you navigate this political landscape? And it's a highly political position. And I think that was the, that's the most um, the, the revelatory of it all. Just this is a highly exposed political position, um, more than I ever anticipated it could be, but it absolutely is. You know. And you must have had to recover hugely from that PR stumble, which I guess you did visiting your friends. So well, um, you obviously did because you're a legend now. But like, <laughs> so I think way. it was. I think what it, it, I, I didn't recover at the time, you know, because I was hung in effigy at City Hall, you know, and the, and the friends just had a, a. It was this was a giant moment for the friends because they really took a big leadership position. They grabbed the narrative. They owned the narrative. That probably is the third giant thing. It's like who owns the narrative around what you're doing, and they, and you have to get out. And <coughs> that's what if you you want. If you're going to put a position out there or, or, or do a particular piece of work, you have to own that narrative. So you have to make your eyes are dotted and your T's across because someone's going to come in and seize it. Even though you think you're doing something just fine, somebody sees the negative in it and they're going to take that and run with that narrative. And so that was. And the press, the inquiry. And, oh my God, unrelenting. Unrelenting. So it was important that as we built a strategic plan and we started rolling out some new initiatives like our Culinary Literacy Center. Yeah. And really changing the kind of services and our and our relationship with community yeah. over these past ten years, that was a very big deal. That's a really big so. Deal. See, you have grit. That's where the big brothers came in. You know. Yeah. I mean, really. No, no kidding. That's why I say I go back to that family. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you didn't have that. As fascinating as it was, I, mean, I, I would have folded. I would have folded about that. No, yeah. no, they weren't going to let me. My brothers. No, no, no but no, I mean, no. but I mean, in that kind of situation. Oh, yeah. That's really not hard to do to make up for what you. Yeah, you and I think that's the other thing is that you know, you know. People expect a girl to cry, and I was like, and the best, one of the best movies I ever watched was the one with um, the baseball, the women's baseball oh, league. Yes. No crying in baseball. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> a league of your own. Okay, yes, guys, you have a question here. Yes, it's oh, the, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so what I actually wanted to ask you about was um, the library, the partnerships that they're doing around the city. like. Um, and I'm really interested in the work you're doing in South Philadelphia, where you have the Integrated Health Center and the Community Center. And I was wondering what sparked that partnership and what future do you see as the library as part of these integrated community units? So that was, uh, so the then uh, head of CHOP, his name was Steve Altschiller, was on my trustee board and he was looking for a place uh, to put another primary care clinic in, or to put a CHOP primary care clinic in South Philadelphia. And he, he and I sat and talked about it. He said, how about I take over your library space um, and we build the building, um, I, I get my primary care clinic. And then it, so it really was his influence, I have to say. Um, and he brought the city in because the way the building works, and I, so my response to Steve was, was you know, hey, I got a 12,000 square foot building. Um, and you, you can do whatever you want because our libraries are all so little. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's probably one of the big challenges is you know, our capacity to really deliver on some really good services. But anyway, so, um, so with that, yeah, that building has a primary care, CHOP primary care clinic, clinic on the third floor. It has a city's um, clinic number one, to, which is family, uh, family care. And then the library is on the main floor. And then there's a recreation center uh, on the really, they rebuilt the, the playground in the, in the rear. And um, the goal is that the four, the four um, programs actually combine. So we end up being basically the waiting room, you know, mm -hmm. for either the health center or, or CHOP or after, particularly as you come out of the, um, the city facility for people to come down because they've heard a diagnosis that they were like, oh, what, did I just, what was I just told? So, you know, and providing the rep. So we do have an, um, a strong um, uh, consumer health uh, program there where we don't have it anywhere else in the, si in the system. So, so the idea is that the four of us are supposed to be collaborating on really awesome programming. That's a, that's a work in progress. So, um, and, I, and I will say I give my staff a lot of credit because they're the ones that are constantly pounding on the door saying, Where, where's our wellness in, initiative? Where's our you know, community health program on X, Y, and Z? So mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. Um, I do believe that as we look at the, the camp, and this part of Rebuild is this, is that where there's a library, a rec center, you know, an L, a library, um, trying to think of another um, license and inspections. You know, they, there's, there are these, all of them are in separate buildings. 
and the conversations I was then having with then Mike DeBerardinas, who was the managing director, was like, we should really begin. He's now here at Felt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we were really begin combining these buildings, which are old and dilapidated, into one. And then we can begin talking about sharing staff and with sharing resources. And so I, I, I do think this, it's a promise of rebuild that we can begin mm -hmm. activating that. So it's one thing for Mike and I to have a conversation. It's another thing to sell that to different um, council people who like their individual. They like their, you know, rec center over here and their library over there. Da, da, da. So I just think that the city, for the sake of the city and its ability to sustain um, these facilities, that that mm -hmm. they begin going down that thought process. Did I answer your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very clever. It's almost a public-private partnership. Yeah. yeah, and you, yeah. you will get you will get yeah. private donors to support that yeah. because yeah. it's an efficiency. Yeah. Well, right. and you can tap in local yep. pots of money that right. never, never hurt. Right. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Alyssa. Yep. I'm a second year executive student. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, my library is the, the central library, which I know is probably not <laughs> representative of the whole system. But okay. whenever I'm there, I do feel like it's an amalgamation of Philadelphia. Like all types of people are represented mm -hmm. there. And I love what you said about wanting to meet the goal of whatever the person is that's in the space, meeting their goal. Um, because I actually think about that. I wonder when I'm there, I wonder what people are doing here. But I'm really curious about how you measure success for you and what that looks like and how you um, determine whether you're being successful in meeting the goals that you explained earlier. So that's a, it's a really good question and I don't know that I have a really good answer for it. Um, you, know, you know, so my person, you know, what I look and I love um, and I feel we're being successful is when there are a lot of people in there and there's, the, the places are noisy and there's lots of conversation and people are genuinely curious whether it's the exhibitions that we have or they're up um, working with our library staff on a good deep reference question you know you, you know because it's only through those um, ex you know opportunities and experiences that you're actually going to connect with that individual people Lot of our work is a drop-in work, and people just come in, they get on a computer, or they come in, um, and so you want people to come in. But it, it's more about um, when I when I see the interactions with sta with between staff and a, and a constituent, that's when I know we're successful because we're doing that. To me, we're doing something right because there's something about that interaction, or there's something about that you know that that reaching to the curiosity or the or the reference question that actually got asked that you're able to sort of unpack and sort of begin to bring, bring the resources to that individual. So, um, and to me, as long as this library is considered number one, number two, and number three of the most important city services that gets provided, I know that we're doing a good job. And so is it? We're, you, we're usually either two or three. How is it ranked? I mean, who like answers? So the public, it's actually a public survey that okay. gets put out every year, I think by city council, mm -hmm. right? And, and of course the fundraising dollars. You know, if you're not, if your organization isn't considered um, sort of um, innovative and thought-provoking, mm -hmm. you're you're not going to raise the money you need to raise. And mm -hmm. I think we're I think we're doing a pretty good job for, what are they for a public sector right? organization. Because here's one of the mm -hmm. dilemma we have: is that people think because you're a city-funded organization, you're then ter therefore taken care of. The city takes care of you, and we're like, whoa, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. And so then, so it's all of, yes, precisely, because yeah. it's all about talking about. A library in the 21st century, and what is a library in the 21st yeah. century? Still, it's buildings and books. Well, almost, um, but it really is about the work that we're doing mm -hmm. around the experience and the, mm -hmm. the, the provocative yeah. programming and that whole work that we're all trying to get to on mm -hmm. civic engagement because of the craziness that's mm -hmm. going on now. So, yeah. You've also built very cleverly a power, high-powered board. High-powered yes. board is critical. That, that's How big that's is your board? So I have three boards. Oh God! You know, because over 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 the last uh, five years ago, we took responsibility for the Rosenbach Museum and Library on 22nd, and um, because they were having some financial troubles, and <clears throat> our rare book collection was built by the same guy uh, who built the Rosenbach, right? So, hmm. kind of serendipity there. So the, there's a board of trustees, which is the sort of the charter organization that's the governing board. There's the board of directors, which is the foundation board that's. So there's 22 members on the board of trustees, there's 40 members on the board of directors, which is the fundraising organization, and then there's 30 members on the Rosenbach board. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. That's a big job right there. I have two positions just working on that. Yeah. So where do we want to go? Yeah. So let's go with you and then we'll go to you. Okay. So just to build off of your comment about the 21st century library, um, I'm curious to know, so I've read a little bit about like what some of your other colleagues across the country are doing in terms of programming and right. services and whatnot from providing 3D printers, right, for, for folks to be able to print certain things to 
renting out everything from musical instruments to, to stuff to be able to use around the house and, and that kind of stuff. So what I'm curious to know is, is when you think about your mission, right, like what is the edge of that, right? Like what do you consider to be, what is the thought process that goes into what is too far outside of what is really what our, what our mission is and what is then like just within that, that, that. So that's, uh, again, a really good question because I, um, I don't know where too far goes because if in fact your constituency is saying, you know, particularly in the city where you know, still 27% of the people in the city live in deep poverty. Mm -hmm. So we have a library and we have our lending musical instruments and we lend cake pans and all, you know, we do all of that. Um, and that really is, um, it's evolutionary because again, you're, and then, and then, I don't know if you know this, there's a tool library unassociated with the free library in West Philadelphia. So if you don't want to go buy yourself an electric mower, you can go borrow an electric mower wow. from this tool library. How cool is that? And I want to take over that place. So. <laughs> That's so cool. A tool tool business. Library. Yes, it is. So, so if the community is saying this would be a really great thing for you to do, um, and I have to say the library, and it's all coming from staff who are hearing from their constituents. And it's, it's basically ensuring that, so as we go through the process of workforce development and we're bringing an individual, working with him or her, let's say him because we also lend pocketbooks. And so this is all about the individual, how you prep this person for an interview, put on a sharp tie. We have people, we have Hermes ties on this, you know, in this thing. And it was just a really good idea on the part of somebody who was working with the, you know, this, this workforce group that we have down there. And I want, and, and to me, it's like, why not? Why wouldn't you do this? And so it's, and particularly because everything is donated. It's just like the musical instruments. It's the how many guitars and banjos and, and amazing instruments that we, we would not be able to add to the collection, but my God, is it circulating like crazy. So it wasn't something that came from us. It really was about the community who said, this would be a really cool thing for you to be doing. So. So I think um, because libraries are changing so much on the experience side, I, I don't I don't know. Um, it'll be at, at some point in time it'll be a capacity issue of the staff who are who literally are coming out of library school and and knowing this is the box that I grew up in at, mm -hmm. in library school, and can library school prepare our uh, librarians well enough to hit the ground running on this absolutely disruptive mm -hmm. space a library can and should be. You know, so, yeah. <coughs> Building on that, can you speak to some of the, I guess, services that are less obvious that we might not actually be aware of that libraries are now providing these days? So it's, not, it's in addition, well, it's how libraries, uh, librarians are, are, are sort of, um, uh, I guess, supported by um, the, the fact that we now have social workers in place, by the fact that we now have community organizers place and the fact that we now have nurses in place in fact so so yes it is um, it's one of these disruptions where people now see us as a social service agency so but it's why not again this is where I come from versus some of the more traditional librarians who want to do that 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 their reference work and that's the pedagogy from which they came and all that um, I'll, I'll tell you a story so we knew we uh, when we brought in um, the social workers had everything to do with um, the not insignificant homeless population um, that were present in the library. Everybody's allowed to be in there. And so, but every now and then, um, an individual would come in, wasn't having a good day. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's an interaction between the staff and this individual that isn't good, it's not healthy, and it's gonna end up in a bad place. Um, and so, we then went to the Department of Behavioral Health and they um, agreed to support us in this, in, this, um, um, in this work. So we were not the first ones to bring social workers into this and we modeled it after the San Francisco Public Library who has, if you think we have a homeless population, you should see the homeless population in San Francisco. And they were in their central library just like us. And so it was that model that we brought to the Free Library of Philadelphia. And what these two men do essentially is they spend more time pulling my staff back from the edge um, in that and just really understanding you don't know what you, you do not have the capacity, you weren't trained in this capacity, we're here, call us, we can, because the interaction between our social worker and that individual who's having, not having a good day and my staff who's trying to interact with that individual who's a, a worlds apart. Because then the social worker can, the, the whole body language and the whole tone of their voice and and the ability to have the conversation about moving that individual to services is 
far different from anything that we can do. And then the other thing was um, we had um, a woman, had, we do have still have nurses in our lobby, um, come, and so folks who come in who are sort of on the brink. So this one day, this one woman came in with her bags. Um, can't tell whether she was totally homeless or not, but you know, people, people who are sort of on the edge, you know, they, everything comes with them because they don't know what's gonna happen in the next minute. Sat down with the nurse, um, nurse, because uh, it was blood pressure day, and so she sat down and her blood pressure was heavily elevated and she started explaining to the nurse what was going on with her life. Immediately, Melanie was able to reach back to Charles, who was there, who's the social worker, and you know, just go and you know, begin to support this woman and get her the services she needs. So, is this a typical place for this to happen in a public library? No, but are, am I, are we going to shy away from that because we happen to be open and we happen to be more ours and we're accessible and people now know that there's a safety net for them in this space? I think I think it's a traditional but important to do. Okay, but two more questions. Yes, here we go. So you are saying this is the first that you have to explore in this position. <laughs> yeah. And I'm curious to know that what advantage and disadvantage do you think uh, as being a female leader uh, in a big, uh, huge uh, nonprofit on the field? So I, I don't know that they were ready for me in particular, <laughs> but they were ready for a woman um, to be in this job. I think that they're, um, you know, I, I think that there's uh, work that we do on the sensitivity side when it comes to employee relations that I think is is, is probably important. Um, and I, I, but I do think because the profession is largely female, um, it was important for our, our female um, staff members to see the fact that they they should they can step up into the important roles in the organization where they didn't feel um, they uh, I don't I don't know that they felt. Uh, able to do that, um, but it's it's important that um, the females begin to get rep become representative in organizations where they dominate the profession, and that was it's only it's only started happening in the last ten years because prior than that, most of the administrative positions and library and chief library positions around the country were men. So not that I don't love my men, but it's it's time for us as highly successful individuals to be able to step up and own work that's ours as well. So and to square your shoulders and do it. So. It's just, it's that whole concept of just do it. You might be afraid to do it, but just do it. But I have to say my boards have been beyond supportive of my of my work here. It's been, thank God for them on, on lots of levels. Well, thank God for you. I mean, what you have done in 11 years is astounding. Oh, thank so you. We are very, very lucky to have you. Okay, last question. Yes, Ina. So what's the last book you took out of the library? Oh, <laughs> that I took out of the library. I actually went on hold called. Uh, uh, That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Uh, it was actually, um, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, and it was, I was on my way to Greek, Greece last year, but it's, it's been a year since I borrowed a book from the library. Um, uh, it, and it had to do with um, the, the Greek, what, what Greek theater was, I'm trying to remember what the name of the book was, so fascinating, it was all about the emergence of Greek theater and, in, in Athens, and that, you know. It's a book that everybody knows when you go to, when you go to, Greece, you have to read this because it is the sort of primer on no. ancient Greece. And I'm sorry, you all remember that book, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 when I send the when yeah. I send the uh, the PowerPoint, I'll send yeah. the name of the book that I. I, uh, I it was fascinating. Yeah. A little weird, but it's very fascinating. <laughs> so, last question, really. Um, actually, I have two last questions. One, okay. and it sort of feeds off that. Do you think in five, 10, 20 years we'll have books? I mean, will it yeah. all be online? Will it no. all be no? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm convinced that we're not going to, books will, particularly books for children and, yeah. and families are going to be an important yeah. because that is sort of that important inter, in, you know, interconnection and, yeah. and finding love uh, of a baby yeah. sitting with their parent and learning to, yeah. learning words and more, you know, just yeah. so it is a warmth and a yes. beauty to yes. that early, liter yes. early literacy process. Um, but interesting now, interesting uh, learning now is that our millennial um, generation is more about the tactile book than they are about reading electronically. Really? So there's this huge reemergence of, of print material wow. um, that, uh, that's, wow. that's really sort of like, uh, you know. Because they grew up without it. But really they, probably, and, then, and the, what there really is this sort of piece yeah. of you sitting with yeah. a book and rather, you know, yeah. just sort of flipping a page and dropping
dropping it yeah. on the floor when you fall asleep yeah. kind of stuff, which yeah. is hard to do when you have your yeah. cell phone or your... Um, okay, okay, here's my sub question. I have another one after this. I promise. <laughs> no, stop, I promise. It's so fascinating. What's your view of Amazon? And like, do you know what proportion of books are sold on Amazon? And, you know, is it a good or bad thing? So, I love Amazon. You, you know, and it's a quirky thing. So, <laughs> so whenever, like, this is so interesting about library work. I said, so, uh, we have this really ridiculous legacy system of our catalog. And if our librarians can't find it in the catalog, what do they do? They go onto Amazon and they get all of the information off Amazon and then they go look at our catalog. <laughs> it's kind of like laborious. But no, I have, I'm a fan of Amazon, quite uh -huh. frankly. Yeah. I think, you know, if ever there was um, an ease of shopping, this was, this was my first year um, that I literally did my Christmas shopping by buying from Amazon and having, mm -hmm. and I liked it very much. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So, um, and I don't know the answer about how many how many books are, are bought on Amazon, although I do believe it's declining. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting, um, so I don't know if you've all heard about the Amazon four, four star shop, the, the, the four star shop, the four star store, and I think it's in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And literally it's everything but the books. Really? So um, it's all the four star items that um, that people rate on Amazon are mm -hmm. is now in this four star store really? and, but without the books. Yeah, oh, interesting. Which I found interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. field trip, field trip. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, promise, last question. So I'd love to know what's next for you and what's next for the library. And if you were king, or queen, 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 <laughs> what, what would those things look like if, if you could have the perfect next thing for, for each of you? So I'm 62 and I know I'm not going to be here much longer. You know, it's just a, just a, you know. Oh, a planet? No. No, no. Healthy as a horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's you know so ten years, eleven years in, how much longer you know? And I and I really do want to make way. You know, I, I think about succession planning a lot. And as I watch, um, you know, the reason we created the cluster models is I wanted to see who was ready for the next for the next level of leadership in, in the organization. That and I can absolutely identify quite a number, which is nice to sort of see people come and sort of emerge through the organization and uh, enjoy leadership and enjoy management, which is important because there's a lot of people who are in who are in supervisory positions that don't want to be there, but they, they took those jobs because that's where they could make more money. And so you have to be careful about that. Um, so I'm happy about that, that I think that there we've developed a leadership cohort that if I got hit by a bus on my way home, there's the, the library's going to be just fine. So, so I feel good about that. Um, but for me, it's just it's so to me to make time and, and step away so that I leave the organization in a healthy, good place. I don't want to overstay my welcome. Um, so, so next for me is probably something to do with politics. You know, I, I think about running for office a lot. You know, so we will run the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cool. Okay, well, yeah. keep us posted. Uh, we had a conversation, and it's like her her father is <laughs> ready to have her go. I want to see her run for office. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of mentioning that maybe I'll run for office someday. My father is really latched on. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, at least he's not the other way around. That's fantastic. That's true. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been fantastic.